Okay, so I'm just going to do kind of a brain dump of um, thing of you know what what our experience has been with WebAssembly and what we want, and uh, I'll probably you know say some things that don't make sense. And uh, I, part of part of this, I, I hope to kind of learn you know what sorts of things are kind of fair game for for talking about here. You know which which, which things are going to be just for us to figure out, and or which versus which things uh, you're interested in uh, implementing or designing around. So that that I think it'll be kind of a discussion. Uh, so some some warnings. Uh, so we we last worked on this about a year ago. Uh, we worked on it for a few months uh, last December. Uh, so probably some of this is out of date. I know a lot of things have been Im improved and fixed and added. Uh, so there's some of this is probably old. Uh, and also I, I wasn't the one who did most of the work. It was done by Ken O'Fisher and Valentin Taravi. So I, I don't know everything, but uh, I've talked to them a lot, and I think I, I think I know the issues. But we might we might hit the limits of my knowledge though. Uh, okay, so first, uh, what are our use cases? Why do we want it? Uh, so a, a big one is giving people a fast zero install way to use the language. Uh, this is especially great for teaching and giving tutorials and stuff like that, where you want everyone to be able to get their hands on uh, using the language immediately without any install. Uh, so we've done that before by running hosted instances, uh, but that of course, you know, eventually you run out of free credits and it's not sustainable. Um, so we have now nowadays we have people install locally, which you know works, but it has all the, the usual problems. So running it in, in the browser would be basically the ideal way to, for people to start using the language. Uh, so that would be huge. Uh, of course, people want to run the full language and full applications uh, in the browser uh, as well. And plus, uh, a lot of people also want to do split client server applications as well, because Julia is used for a lot of you know big iron kinds of computations where you have a lot of compute on the back end and then some you know, interaction on the front end. So we kind of want all of these use cases. Uh, uh, and actually, and then there's another one there at the end, which is very speculative at this point, uh, is that you know, currently we target LLVM and we're also targeting WebAssembly via LLVM or have been trying to. Uh, and LLVM is a pretty slow compiler because it's meant really as a ahead of time compiler. Uh, and so we have a lot of uh, latency and compile time kinds of problems. And if we could do a, a pure WebAssembly backend, one thing I would maybe hope for is we could get a more uh, latency optimized JIT compile environment, uh, which would to which we could just then piggyback on. And that could be potentially very nice because a lot of people care about latency. And we're not very good at latency right now. We're really pretty much a throughput, through, throughput focused uh, operation. All right, so how far did we get? Uh, we did manage to port our full runtime, uh, which includes an interpreter uh, to WebAssembly. We got a Julia prompt in the browser. So that was that was very cool. We basically got it something you could use. Uh, so that was nice. Uh, it was interpreted only though. We didn't, uh, we didn't have the compiler fully working. Um, the hardest part was probably the coroutines was we have symmetric coroutines and basically stack switching uh, in the language. Uh, and that required uh, quite some heroic hacks to sort of get working, uh, which I think we used asyncify and some 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 things in, in Inscript and I don't fully understand, but uh, that, I think that was kind of the hardest part. And I think it's uh, it still has some performance issues. Uh, it doesn't it just barely works. Doesn't work super well. Uh, so that's going to be a big uh, a big topic here, I think. Uh, so why did we stop? Uh, so basically, mostly just the usual reasons, you know, like what our priorities are. Uh, it's something we want, but it's not at the very top of our list of things we want. So, you know, it's the usual resources kinds of reasons is the main reason. Uh, but the other kind of gripes I've heard uh, is that debugging was very difficult. Uh, but I see now, I think, really recently dwarf support has been added, if I understand correctly. So I think that's uh, that's likely fixed already. Uh, so it's it's yeah it's great that there is a, to see dwarf support in there. Uh, so I think that would that would be a game changer for us at this point. Uh, we would also highly recommend trying to have something like RR, the Mozilla Record and Replay framework. Uh, I think it would be, at least in theory, possible to to make that work for the WebAssembly environment, and that would be amazing because that has been uh, just a total development game changer. I mean, it's a, it's the closest thing to just having a magic oracle that tells you where your bug is. It's just really unbelievable. Uh, so our RR is just a, is a total game changer and having, having that will definitely uh, get a lot of people's attention. 
Joanna echoes your sentiment in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and to clarify, when you're, you're talking about debugging here, you're not talking about debugging Julia programs. You're talking about debugging the Julia compiler. Is that correct? I think probably both. Okay. Yeah, probably both. And yeah, de yeah debugging everything, you know, get, get, getting uh, getting the runtime working. Uh, yeah, Ken Keno told me the debugging experience was not uh, not very good. Uh, and the other thing we ran into is that, uh, and this is you know partly all our fault, I suppose, but we we tend to generate very large amounts of code, or or need a very large uh, code image. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that we have kind of a you know a very uh, batteries included kind of uh, environment. I mean, you know, when, when you get the default build of Julia, there are already like tons of libraries in there. So there's, you know, Blast and Laypack and plus and uh, PCRE and just on, there are many, many libraries that are just already loaded by default. Uh, and plus we have our own standard library um, that is pretty, pretty hefty. And we compile all of that and it all has, you know, uh, specializations for lots of different types and all of this. So, so we, we tend to generate lots of code uh, and our default image is quite big. So we were we were trying to run, you know, I, when we uh, started trying to compile uh, Julia, we were trying to generate hundreds of megabytes of code and it basically didn't work. Uh, I think probably just something just sort of took forever or ran out of memory or something like that. I, I don't really understand what the problem was, but I know we were we were just generating too much code and it, it something fell over. So that's kind of the sort of the main uh, issues we ran into. All right, so I will uh, drill down a little bit more on pretty much the big, uh, you know, code data control flow. Pretty much covers everything. Uh, so yeah, JIT uh, JIT compilation concerns, uh, object model, maybe a bit about GC, uh, and control flow coroutines and exceptions. Which, uh, so I just have kind of a little bit on each one of these. All right, so the way we uh, JIT today is it's a, a very we have a very simple architecture. We don't have a very sophisticated JIT, so in, in that sense, it, it's it's pretty easy uh, to bring up and running because we basically just do method at a time JIT. Um, and when we so when we need a new method and you know LLVM, I, my understanding is that LLVM and WebAssembly have kind of a similar module based architecture where you uh, you know you you create a module which in LLVM's case basically corresponds to like an object file uh, and you generate code into it. Uh, so basically when we need to compile something, we open a new module. Uh, we have to then put in declarations and imports for all, everything that it's going to call. Uh, and then we generate our code and everything is also exported because uh, in general, you know, with very, very few exceptions, everything uh, we generate, someone else is going to need to compile in the future. So basically everything is exported. Uh, and we need to be able to then, uh, you know, do indirect calls uh, to all of those generated functions, uh, either from the interpreter or from other code. Uh, so we do need some kind of, a, you know, a handle or address uh, to all of those functions. Uh, but I, th I think this will work. So if it's a uh, if this kind of pattern is uh, is possible, if it, if it's okay to have, you know, potentially fairly large numbers of imports and exports from uh, the various modules we generate, then I think that will work. Uh, yeah, so we need we need uh, ideally pretty uh, as good performance as we can get for uh, indirect calls uh, is very helpful. Um, so and we also need uh, yeah. So are you saying so? Because you're compiling new code uh, and you don't know what that new code is going to need to directly call to, essentially, it sounds like you're saying that you're instead just exporting the entire function table um, rather than using module import exports. And then your compiled mod, your newly compiled module imports that whole table and then jumps to the or indirectly calls to the right thing rather than directly calling through an export function. Is that right? I uh, most of the I think we only need to import the things we directly call because we do generate direct calls as well. Right, but you don't know ahead of time which ones those, those are going to be if, with the JIT, right? Uh, well, at the at the point where we compile it, we do know.
I'm missing something. So when you for like you can't add exports after you've compiled the original mod module. Yeah. So when you're jitting, you can only you can only directly call the ones that have already been exported, right? Yes. So you'd have to if if you have a small thing, uh, your jits is your is it that. Is your JIT only doing a few direct calls into the main module so you can know a priori where they're going to be? Or is it going to JIT to lots of places and so you have to export lots of things? Uh, it, it varies. It could be it could be a lot of things. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's basically, I, I guess we need, we need, to, uh, we need imports uh, for, for the things that, uh, that we directly generate calls to. So our, in, our indirect calls, like our dynamic dispatches in our language work by basically a, a totally different uh, mechanism. We have to call into the runtime. Uh, right. Thanks. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think it's the case that every, uh, every module needs to import every function. I don't think that's the case, but it, but it can be a lot. I was more wording, wondering, is it the case that every module needs to export lots of functions so that they can be potentially imported by future um, jitted modules. Yeah, that, that is true. Yes. Yeah. Basically everything we generate has to be exported and yeah, publicly callable. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and so we, we also call between C and Julia a fair bit. And so we need something like DL sim that will let us look up, uh, a, look up a symbol in a C program and call that. Uh, so that's that's something else we would need, or or a good replacement. Uh, it doesn't have to be called DL sim, I suppose, but uh, the the moral equivalent. Um, and also, yeah, some some sort of dynamic code loading so that we can load uh, load libraries on demand. I know is that is that supported uh, currently? Um, it depends on. At what time and how? Uh, so right now, like, there's nothing in WASM that has it, but you can do it through the JS API. Okay. Uh, the complication that people are encountering is uh, you are gonna have a sort of you're probably gonna want to have a, put a stub in there that then says, okay, load this thing. But the problem is that that load is gonna be asynchronous, so that stub now has to be async like asynchronous, and that and then that causes its own problems. Um, so if you're using Asyncify, that might help. I think that might already mitigate some of that, but I don't know if it mitigates mm. all of that. Or in the future with stack switching, you can swap yeah, yeah. out the stack yeah. and One await, of the, reasons that await the promise. <laughs> yeah. So there's that, there's, what Luke is referring to is there is uh, work in progress on developing things that where you can do stack switching directly. So it's, it's some of the issues with cover teams. Um, and also th that would also address this to achieve um, dynamic loading of code and that being done asynchronously. Um, but that's also <laughs> That's not even phase one yet. So okay, yeah, that's that's fabulous. And if yeah, if, I think if uh, yeah, if there's some sort of stack switching available, we will be incredibly happy. That's that's almost the main ask of all of this. Actually, I could have just joined this and just said, please give us stack switching. Okay, goodbye. And that <laughs> that would have that would really would have covered ninety percent of it. <laughs> so for for that, it'll be useful. It'll be useful for y'all to follow up on what kind of stack switching you would like specifically, what are the use cases, and so on. I mean, you don't have to have it in this presentation. I'm guessing that's weird and stuff. But um, that's because there's lots of different forms. And one of the things we're trying to figure out is which form of stack switching do we want, and how do we do that in a sort of well head in a way that still respects the, the environment and all that stuff. Yeah, so we've used several implementations. Uh, in, I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, OK, so the. Uh, the object model. So this this may not be relevant. Um, so you know, mostly we uh, we we compile to LVM just fine. So you know, an LVM's type system is is pretty rich. You know, it has arrays and structs and vector types and, and all of that stuff. It's a it's a pretty good set of data types, uh, and we map to that pretty well. That's that works quite well for us. Uh, I think I gather it has more uh, data types than WebAssembly at least at the moment. I believe. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a WASM uh, backend for LVM. So it's certainly possible to, to do all that stuff. Um, but I guess the, the big question is, uh, is there, um, is, is the WebAssembly runtime 
ever going to have a garbage collector. And there's a proposal for that and also in progress. Um, one question I have, because if I'm right, Julia like.net has generics and specializes on generics. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so that's something that I don't think we and the garbage collection proposal have been focusing a lot on. Like it's something that is in our mind, but hasn't been focused on a lot. Um, so yeah. I know that, that you guys would need that too. Yeah, I would. I mean, I, I would. My instinct is that if it would be great if there is a GC, I would. That would be cool. That'd be cool. Um, but I would. I would prefer if it sort of didn't touch the uh, the topic of, of generics. Sure. Good feedback. <laughs> that would be perfectly fine with me. Uh, I would. Yeah. Well, well, all we really need is if you know if we can allocate objects and we can tell you where the pointers are in them. That's basically enough. Uh, and we so so yeah we we do have uh, a little bit of you know more, more we, so we have more complicated object layouts than than JavaScript exposes at the language level, uh, so we have things like structs with a mix of pointers and non-pointers, and they can be inlined in other structs and they can be inlined in arrays as well. So there will be uh, you know we can have a struct that has pointers at certain offsets and there might be an array of those, uh, and then there might be alignment padding, as well. Uh, so but but it's not too crazy. Do you have uh, do you have uh, interior pointers? No, so that's easy. Yeah, we don't. That's we don't very use, similar uh, to the .NET object model then, because um, all those things we described .NET has similar to, and also does not have interior pointers except for temporary inter interior pointers on the stack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's really similar to the the .NET object model. Yeah. So if I think if if .NET object model worked well, I think we would we would be able to work well also. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it would be nice to to reuse uh, the host GC if possible. Uh, of course, it brings up a lot of issues, but it would be I mean it, yeah it would it would help a lot with the whole uh, bulk of the thing to drop all the code for our garbage collector, uh, and it just seems like the right way to do it. I think really is if if there is a, you know of course the JavaScript runtime has a GC. Um, so if WebAssembly and then we could also reuse that, I think that is the right way to do it. Uh, but of course, there's going to be uh, there's there's going to be pain about uh, uh, tracking references between languages. Like we need to keep uh, references to Julia objects from C, for example. Uh, so we would need some way to do that. But it's all I, you know, all usual uh, GC interop uh, kinds of uh, kinds of things. I think. Do you have uh, any, uh, do you do any stack inspection? Uh, what, what do you mean by that? So does you, do, do, you, do any of your libraries sort of walk up the Julia stack and looking for, you know, for example, debugging if you're printing the variables or do you do, you do, dynamic, do, you do dynamic scoping in any form? Uh, no, we, so we, we would, uh, yeah, well we do, uh, we, we have exception handlers which is kind of uh, one one small form of that, uh, but we don't and and we have uh, we have stack walking code of course uh, for generating stack traces. Uh, ah, so you oh, okay? Is that part of the exception? Uh, we so yeah, so we save stack data for exceptions often, uh, and we basically use you know the typical uh, stack of dwarf info and lib unwind uh, for doing that right now. But it's uh, but we don't we don't have the kind of uh, stack inspection where you can say you know go to the call three frames up and tell me it's local variables like that you can't do that from a program so we don't have that sort of thing. But do, do, does the does your runtime use it? Uh, we we only use it as far as we need for uh, uh, scanning for roots in the GC uh, mm -hmm. and for uh, throwing exceptions. Uh, and for printing stack traces for debugging, you know, that's it. So anything that plays those roles will be sufficient. Okay, so yeah, it seems like uh, if people are thinking, uh, would people want to support the .NET object model? I think that'll probably make us happy if there's going to be a, a GC. Okay, so the uh, 
coroutines thing that we have. So it's a very, really simple API uh, where you can make a, what we call a task object uh, that runs a certain function. Uh, and then you can hand it to a scheduler uh, to run, and then you can wait for it. Uh, or you can just block and you can get a reference to the currently running task. And this is pretty much the whole API that you need. Um, the other possible operation is the, the yield primitive that just that explicitly switches to another task. Um, so well, of course, one way to implement this is to implement just this yield operation uh, where you just say which task to switch to. And if you just have that operation, you can make a scheduler on, and you can build a scheduler on top of that. Uh, but in fact, I, you know, over time we are moving away from the explicit yield because uh, the, the basic the scheduler and synchronization objects we think generally work better. Uh, so we're moving to just saying, you know, schedule this and then everything else is mediated by channels and locks and other kinds of synchronization primitives. Uh, so we don't necessarily need the yield uh, primitive to be exposed in the language. It's kind of vestigial, I think, for us at this point. Uh, but these are basically the, the operations that we need to support for uh, coroutines. Is, the, is your schedule written in Julia? Uh, part, part of it is. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's sort of a yeah, it's kind of kind of a combination of Julia and C at the moment. For for an interesting variety of, of reasons. Uh, so we've had we've had quite a few implementations of this over time. Uh, so initially we used stack copying. So we would uh, when you want to switch uh, switch stacks, just copy out the live data to a side buffer and copy in the stack data from the other task. Uh, so that's a little bit slower on switching time, but it's uh, sometimes it's good because there are, there are certain uh, operating systems or other libraries you might interoperate with that do not like running outside of the uh, initial process stack. Uh, so that can kind of help there sometimes, but we don't use that anymore. Um, now we, we have a, a pool of uh, mmapped stacks. So we use a pretty large amount of uh, virtual address space uh, quite a large amount, actually, because it's uh, it's we use eight megabytes of stack space. Uh, unfortunately, we we need a pretty big uh, default stack size because our uh, because of the way our compiler interrupts execution, uh, it might the compiler might use a fair bit of stack space even if the user's code doesn't. Uh, so it's it's just handy for us to have lots of stack space available all the time, and the virtual memory uh, system handles it very well. So why, you know why not? So we're a little bit profligate with that, uh, but it works. It works fine. Uh, and so now it, each uh, each task gets its own uh, stack from the pool, and we just uh, m map more of them as needed. Uh, it's only yeah, it's kind of a problem on things like thirty two bit windows where you can't do too much of that. But uh, on on most uh, modern systems, it's it's fine, uh, and we have multiple. Uh, backends for actually doing the switching. So we do uh, a combination of set jump, long jump, plus some custom assembly code. Uh, we have a lib unwind uh, version of it. We have a version that uses get context, set context. Uh, we also have a version that uses a sig alt stack, uh, which we, we have implemented, but I don't think we've ever actually used. So someone just kind of went, uh, went a bit crazy thinking of how many uh, stack switching backends they could implement. But uh, so we have we've done several before, and then there's the the asyncify uh, .js became the uh, became the next one when we when we did the WebAssembly port. So we've done we've done several uh, styles and implementations. You have well, what I guess high level question is um, for Julia. Do you so you mentioned that having large stack sizes is what is a good fit for Julia. Um, uh, or at least default stack sizes. Are there any other kinds of uh, implementation experiences that you think are particularly relevant for stack switching as people who are trying to figure out how to do it for WebAssembly? Hmm. The answer can be no, it's fine. <laughs> I just didn't know if something came into your head. It's like, we tried this and it didn't work. And that was surprising or we found, did, tried this and that made this much better or something like that. 
Yeah, well, they're just, you know, they're, they're painful things uh, you run into, like there are versions of the JVM, for example, when you, if, we, if someone tries to load the JVM and, and call it and it finds it's not on the stack it expects, it, it, it gives up, you know, for no really good reason. Like that's, we've run into things like that. But so it can be, it can, it can bring up some annoying things. But uh, at this point, yeah, they, these things do gradually get resolved. So the fact, that, the fact that your stacks are eight megabytes, does this mean that you're not growing the stacks? Yeah, we, we just rely on the virtual memory subsystem to, to handle that. We just MMAP eight megabytes and just let it, let it handle it. Yeah. R right. So an individual stack can't grow out of the eight megabytes. Right. Yeah. After eight megabytes, you're done. Uh, because yeah, we can't, we can't, we don't have the ability to move a stack and uh, also having it be non-contiguous has a cost and we didn't want that either. So the only thing that would, we could land on that we felt would work well for us is just to have enough space that uh, users typically won't have to worry about running out. Right. Uh, when you certainly has trade-offs. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, we've been seeing exploring all the trade-offs ourselves. So I can it's very useful to get your perspective on it. Um, when you you have a yield two construct and all that stuff, and you mentioned the piler, is there a reason why like for yield two, do you compute do you do you yield to the scheduler and then yield, have the scheduler pick the next stack and then yield to that stack? Or do you run the scheduler on the stack that's yielding? Uh, the second one. So yeah, what, what it actually do, what you actually do is call the scheduler. Uh, you just, yeah, just as a function call, the scheduler picks the next task to, task to run and switches to it. All right. So that's, yeah, which, I, which I think is a good way to do it because you don't want to have to do two switches. Wait. Did you, out of curiosity, have you tried the other way or is it just running um, out of intuition? Did we, uh, we, we might, it's very possible we've tried it at one point because it's, it's pretty easy to, to try because a lot of it is just written in Julia. Um, so we did, we did try it. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's just a little bit slower as you might expect, but uh, I don't have a lot to report about that. No worries. Uh, what was I I, I'm not sure what the advantage of having a dedicated uh, scheduler task would be. Maybe there's some advantages. I don't know. It doesn't seem worth it to me though. And, and, oh yeah. Similarly, for you said the for the compiler, you run it on the same stack, and that's why you need a large stack as your default. Uh, could you not sort of switch to a compiler stack and then switch back so that you don't have to have that overhead? We could do that. Yeah, I think that's something we've tried in the past as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think yeah. I I don't know why we don't do it now. I think because I, I think we could get away with uh, shrinking these stacks if we uh, called the compiler and the GC uh, on their own. Uh, dedicated tasks so that that might make sense. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a possibility. Fish, yeah, was exploring the space. There's what would a, what would a, what would a large number of active tasks be for for Julia? Uh, I mean, we, we, we would consider a large number to be, I mean, millions, I guess. Uh, but that I don't think a lot of people have applications that actually do that. I think in in practice, people might get up to thousands. But we certainly do, you know, stress tests where there are millions. But it is important that you're saying that essentially a reasonable uh, something a version of stacks switching for to suit your needs would need to reasonably support thousands of stacks. Yeah, if it's if Sounds it supports, weird. you know. Tens of thousands, that, that would be OK. Yeah. Okay, that's useful scaling. Um, we'll yeah. let you move on to another slide. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah, so exceptions, uh, we basically use set jump, long jump. Uh, as I said, yeah, OK, the, G, the GC needs to scan the stacks. And so we, we use a linked list uh, of root lists embedded in the stack. That's how our, our GC works now. Uh, so if it's uh, if the stack has some other representation, we'd have to work that out. Of course, it also depends if we're reusing uh, the host GC. Uh, but yeah, any some any some kind of uh, first class uh, stack switching uh, that would that's that's sort of our, our main main ask really, because I think it's just uh, especially for uh, for event handling, uh, you know, I all your kinds of I/O uh, and concurrency and multi-threading and uh, all of that stuff. I think the uh, ha having this 
uh, kind of task model running on a pool of, of threads is just sort of the right way to do it. Uh, and you know, increasingly, I think that's basically what everyone is doing. Like if Go, Go does something pretty similar to that, uh, and you have like the, uh, you know, the Silk, uh, Silk runtime, thread building blocks runtime. This is kind of, this is this become this thing that everybody now is doing, but everyone has their own implementation. And so it's, it's, it's so I, I think it's it's time that you know every platform just sort of support supported this out of the box. I think this this is sort of the new standard in my opinion. Uh, and I'm and I, I'm pretty flexible. Like you know, every uh, often when I talk about this with people, people have very detailed views of like exactly what kind of scheduling do you use. There, there of course there you know there's endless scheduling algorithms, um, and there's all kinds of variations and details of how you can do this. And personally, I you know I act I don't really care as long as I can you know spawn a task and wait for a task and it'll run on some pool of threads. Uh, you know, it, that's anything like that I'm fine with, you know, and of course, people who are very into this are, are horrified that I don't have a more nuanced opinion, but any, anything of that sort is, that's what I want, you know, <laughs> anything of that sort is fine. Um, and yeah, so, uh, of course, migrating tasks uh, between threads, this is actually, we, we do need to be able to do this. We actually can't do it today. It's sort of a bug, uh, but it's high on our list of, of things to fix. Uh, and of course, the, the reason for that is there is uh, there is thread local state. Uh, yeah, thread thread local storage is extremely important. I should have put that on this list, but um, yeah, there is thread local state. And when, if you uh, if a task migrates uh, to another thread, you have to know that you need to reload the thread local state. Uh, so that can be a little tricky, and we haven't actually done that yet. We haven't finished uh, implementing that. Rather, is uh, it thread local state? Or a stack or a stack local state. Which one is it for you? There's, there's both. Okay. Yeah. So we actually have, we need both task local and thread local state. And what do you use them for? Just to give us some context. Uh, so let's see. So, well, I mean, even uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of things. So um, so you can do a, a lot of things work okay if you have uh, where you have kind of a global resource like a random number generator, uh, for instance, works okay if you just have one per thread. You don't really need one per task. So for some kinds of, of uh, reproducible RNG, you actually do need one per task. Uh, but if you if you don't care about reproducibility, uh, just having a state uh, per thread is sufficient. So you can have each task just just use 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 the state of whatever thread I'm on. Uh, works okay for some things. Uh, it also works for uh, certain kinds of external libraries, uh, like you might call a library that makes you uh, allocate, you know, a, a context object to talk to it with. And it's, if you just have one per thread, you're okay. Uh, but why don't I quickly just look at what's in our? Uh... You don't have to go into more depth. I just wanted a little glimpse into what you were, what you were using. You said it was critical, so I just wanted some sense of why it's critical. Yeah, it's 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 quite critical. Well, okay. Also, some some things, of course, are internal to the scheduler, like just having you know what is the current task on each thread. Uh, so some of those are internal things. Uh, and of course, all some of it, of course, is also like GC uh, GC heaps. There's a GC heap per thread. Uh, but if we were reusing that, I guess that wouldn't be in there. So, oh, you so you don't have memory sharing across threads, sort of like JavaScript. Oh no, we do. It's all it's all shared memory, but it's basically the uh, per thread we have a uh, essentially just a, a GC state object so that each thread can allocate simultaneously without communicating, but they can uh -oh. share pointers. Yeah, it's just to avoid uh, needing a synchronization to to allocate. Uh, yeah, so we, we need we need both thread local. We found we need both thread local and uh, and task local state. Uh, and yeah, and also we and, you know in the fullness of time, uh, you could, initially we can kind of get away without it because you know as as I said, just the the spawn and wait uh, and basic synchronization primitives gets you a huge amount of the way. You can do a huge amount of programming with that. Uh, but at, at some point, you do need the full set of atomic operations, uh, memory barriers. Uh, so, like, we don't have uh, a full set of atomic operations in the in the Julia language yet. We we have a few. We have a little bit, 
uh, but not enough. And that's actually one of the reasons why a, a bunch of our scheduler is still written in C, so we can put in uh, the correct uh, atomic uh, memory ordering annotations and memory barriers uh, that are needed. So that's one of the few reasons left that we sometimes need to write C for these things. Uh, but so I think eventually we will uh, we will need uh, yeah some sort of we'll, we'll need we would need that stuff in the in in the back end. For WebAssembly, there's a proposal that's pretty far along now. Luke, do you know how far it is? I'm sorry, uh, what was the question? Um, there's a proposal with threads and atomics and stuff. How and I forget how far, what phase it is now. It's, uh, I forget. I, I think it's actually, it's work on the, uh, the actual, the formal specification is what it's currently doing. It's implementing and even <laughs> shipping in multiple browsers now. So, uh, it's a case where the phase process hasn't been precisely followed. Three, three slash four. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's pretty well baked at this point in time. Okay, so so WebAssembly does currently have a, a shared memory threading model. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the only thing you're you're missing is is the ability to spawn a thread from WASM. For that, you have to call it to do something host specific, which in the web means make a new web worker. Oh, and okay. then you have, I, and, good news. I don't want to spawn threads. <laughs> all right. Cool. If I can, I, I just, I really just want to spawn tasks. That's, that's enough. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> do you want them to, do you want parallelism? Yes. Oh, well, you're going to need to, you're going to need to make some new web workers. Yeah. Well, we, we, we oh, so you like make a fixed pool of work, you would make a fixed pool of threads and then schedule tasks between them. I gotcha. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the, I mean, okay. In a perfect world, the, uh, size of the thread uh, pool might change. We might, but uh, that's not that's not su super important. No, yeah, that that's that's a reasonable model that that people have successfully already done. Um, yeah, on the web today. The, the big UK use case for changing the number of threads at runtime is benchmarking stuff and showing the <laughs> speed ups. That's the use case. Like <laughs> <laughs> benchmarking. Wanna, you know, people want to do something and then you know change the number of threads and then do it again and show that it's faster. That's that's the you know that's the use case. <laughs> Joanna says it's phase two. Thanks, Joanna. Hmm? Phase two apparently is officially where Threads is at. Mm, okay. I, I think once it has official, it needs like official proposed spec text to get farther. That might be what's holding it up, which is of course a very difficult nuanced thing of how does one write up a weak memory model for WebAssembly. I think Andreas and Conrad are working on that together at the moment. Yeah. Uh, okay, now I have a bunch of uh, just miscellaneous stuff. Um, yeah, okay, well, actually, since we're kind of a, on an adjacent topic, what about uh, SIMD? What is the, what are the thinking around uh, vector instructions? It's, there's, for what, 128 bit is currently also pretty far, I think, three, is that right? SIMD is a lot, it's quite far down the road. Yeah, they're almost finishing it. Oh, great. Johannes says, agrees or confirms that it's three. Um, and, but it's specifically 128 bits. Um, there's another one that's uh, looking at larger, but then you get more variability across hardware. So they're trying to figure out how to deal with um, the variability of the size. Yeah, 128 bit is not, is not that big anymore. <laughs> but it is quite widely and portably available, which is its strong thing. So the initial SIMD proposal is kind of aiming at a maximal intersection. Yeah, makes sense. Which which is limited, and then and then how to go beyond that? You have either we start talking about things that are only conditionally fast, and then how do we express that, or things that have long models where you try to give the runtime more flexibility to do the best what it can with what it has, and you know challenges with both directions. But the, the SIMD 128 is kind of like, what can we do that's kind of, it's not too controversial and generally kind of useful. Yeah, well, yeah I'm going to turn on a light because the sun just went down here. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay, yeah, well, people, uh, people are loving the uh, AVX 512. I mean, that just, you can, do, you can do amazing things with that instruction set. It's got, it's got everything in there. <laughs> I'm guessing also for since you, since Julia is largely used for scientific computing, you probably have a lot more need for this kind of data parallelism than uh, many other domains. 
Yeah, yeah. People, people in the Julia world have gone very far with uh, with SIMD stuff. There are yeah, there so there are packages where you can manually program uh, the vector instructions if you want with, with a pretty reasonable API. Uh, and there and there are also packages where people have written you know uh, custom kinds of code generators like loop optimizers uh, that will generate those things for you. Uh, and so yeah, people do a lot, a lot, a lot of that in the Julia world. Yeah. So given, well, I'm, I can guess the, the answer, but so one of the, with the long SIMD approach, the hope is you can provide these portable primitives that can be meaningful regardless of what the maximum vector size on that machine is supported. Cause it'll just be up to the runtime to break it down into yeah. different sizes. But I can imagine it would be maybe problematic for Julia if you wanted to do very, if you had all this hand optimized code that was like, very, you know, that, that wanted to do very special things and, you know, the vector instruction sets or the long vector instruction sets are inherently going to have to follow a fairly conservative model of like what operations they allow. So is what, what I, to go beyond WASM SIMD 128, would you, would it be better to have bigger, you know, explicit vector sizes with like a way to conditionally test, like, is this presence, you know, is this optimized, like some sort of and then take different code paths depending, or would or would it ideally be a thing you would punt to the uh, to the engine? So, un unfortunately, the answer is yes. I mean, the the the, pe the people who are really into this stuff, because there there are people who love this, you know, and they uh they want to know, you know, they want to know everything about the sizes of the various caches. They want to know what SIMD instructions are available, what word sizes are available, uh, and they so the un yeah the people who really care about this, they they do unfortunately want to want to do that and pick pick kernels. Uh, at any time, potentially based on uh, based on what's available, uh, but I, you know, from more from my perspective, I, I, you know, I understand they want every last percent of performance, and that's why they want that. Uh, but I do think it's a it's a slightly unreasonable ask um, because you you know I like abstractions, <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, you can't you it's hard to have abstractions when people. Uh, want to want to go down to that level but the but yeah the answer is a lot of people do people do want that sadly it occurs to me that another thing that's interesting with since julia is largely based on dynamic compilation model it's easier for you you're talking you mentioned something earlier that was something along the lines of generating wasm and then having that compile the browser gives you better latency um and so it might be easier for you to ship sort of uh, mini, Julia, mini Julia core along with Julia code that then you JIT. And the JITting actually would be able to incorporate which SIMD it's in. Um, so it might be even before WASM, you can address those problems. Uh, yeah, possibly, yeah. So yeah. I, an example for, for others in the room, um, like some Julia relies very heavily on code specialization based on runtime type information. Um, uh, so this is how you would like what like addition is like 128 overloadings or something like that. And but well, only well, one depends what you have loaded. But yeah, at, le at least. <laughs> so that but if you know your dynamic if at runtime you know your types, which is very Julia encourages this through. What's the what's the term? Were you trying to stable type stable type stable code? Yes. Yeah. It encourages type stable codes. So that way, there's only one type for a given call, at least at runtime. And so that way, for an overloading that has under 28, rather than scanning through under 28 and figuring out which of them is applicable, you just pick out you uh, at runtime doing that at compile time. You do that, and then uh, you go up. The JIT just takes care of all that for you. Um, so very heavily relies on a lot of it being jitted um, rather than compiled ahead of time. Right. Which gives you possibly a novel opportunity to hook into SIMD specifics rather than having one web, web, web assembly be the one responsible for doing that for you. Yeah, so we wouldn't, uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, so, you know, LLVM has in the, in the LLVM language, there are arbitrary vector sizes. Uh, and then it's, you know, yeah, and then the, the various uh, backends have to figure out what to do with them. Uh, so that's, that's one approach. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you would, I don't know if you would need to do that. Yeah, I don't, I don't I'm not sure. We're just pondering. <laughs> yeah. Hard, hard, hard to say. 
if that's really necessary, if that's necessary or even helpful. Yeah, I don't, because especially the people who do it manually, they're, they're not going to, you know, ask for an arbitrary vector size and think the back end will map it to some, like, that's not even what they want. They want to just do it totally manually. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a question. <laughs> what else um, is on your list? So one, well, yeah, one, one thing I just kind of wanted to uh, call your attention to is this uh, tool we have in the Julia world, binarybuilder.jl, uh, which is written in Julia, but all it really is is a system for uh, cross-compiling binary artifacts and serving them. So we have this kind of big uh, cross-compilation tool chain uh, and environment setup, which is how we distribute uh, binary dependencies for every Julia package. Um, and so it's, it's quite neat, actually. It's, it's really very cool. Uh, you, we, we just, it basically, uh, it's this thing that you, uh, to, add a, to add a library to it, it basically runs a wizard where you basically teach it how to build that library. And then it, it know, and now it knows how to build the library. Uh, and then it can just repeatedly do that. Uh, and so we, and we can, so we can just uh, continuously build and serve uh, binaries for every library we know about for every platform we support you know, in every combination. And we, so we can just send, so yeah, people don't need to uh, compile uh, or otherwise install uh, binary dependencies in Julia. We'll, whenever they need one, we just send them one basically. Um, so this I think is potentially applicable to uh, the WebAssembly world. Uh, if people start needing uh, binaries uh, of, you know, libraries written in C, for example, uh, compiled to run on the WebAssembly platform, you could use this for, for that. Um, and in fact, we did at one point support uh, WebAssembly backend in Binary Builder. Uh, I think it, I think it just stopped getting maintained, or it just sort of bit rotted. But we actually had it had that uh, at one point, and so we probably and we probably will again. Uh, so it's just, I think it's just something to consider for a, a, a tool for, uh, you know, distributing uh, distributing pre-built binaries on demand. Something, something you haven't discussed is um, maybe, so WebAssembly is not specifically to the web, but one of its applications obviously is the web. Um, what kind of JS interop are y'all looking for? Yeah, good, good question. Um, well, we, yeah, we would, of course, like to be able to you know, manipulate the DOM and, and such things. Uh, so I, th I'm pretty sure we need something. Would you, what about, do you want Julia values to be able to, or re like reference values to be able to go out and masquerade as JS values or vice versa? Or is that, do you want a more, do you feel like a sort of CRISPR boundary that's more focusing on functions rather than data transfer um, would be your model? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's quite difficult when you start sharing objects, of course. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I mean, I I might not know enough about JavaScript to have a good answer to that. No worries. Yeah, there's no, some some languages sort of want to have been, uh, I've talked to you have one like a crisp boundary. It's like no, we just want abstract. Here's a DOM handle. We're gonna do stuff with the DOM. You keep that over there and then we'll keep our memory separate and other ones are like no i want especially oo languages often they're like well no i already am an oo language so i just want to call javascript objects as if they're my oo objects and and vice versa you know i have my oo objects go to javascript objects or look like javascript objects and be callable from javascript like that yeah so um, we we do do quite a bit of that for python interop for example you can just move freely move uh, objects between julia and python and basically just use them uh, because you know, because C Python is just the C ABI, so we're able to do that quite easily. Um, so we, yeah, we we do we do that in the case of Python. So if if we could do that with JavaScript, that would be great because it works it works great uh, with Python. So if we can do that, that's great. Uh, but I I don't know if it's absolutely required. Sure. But yeah, it'd be very cool if we could do that. I don't, no, I don't have any questions that come to mind. Now, did you have more questions for us? There's still two more points on this bullet list I only get covered. Oh uh, yeah, so well, we touched a little bit on uh, yeah architecture specific hooks. Yeah, this is 
Oh, this this is the, yeah, the painful day that arrives where you think you have a beautiful abstraction and then the people show up who, uh, you know, who want to know everything about the CPU they're actually running on and then it's everything falls apart. <laughs> um, and yeah, so also, um, yeah, there's some things to consider like what is there a will there be a standard WebAssembly blast like for, for instance, so you could provide um, you could provide a standard blast. Because um, I don't know if it'll make sense to try to take uh, something like OpenBLAST and compile it to WebAssembly. That just might not make sense. Uh, so that's something to think about. I have not thought about that at all. So I don't know if anyone else has thought about that. <laughs> yeah. So we will we will want a, a blast, and uh, a lot of, probably other people will too. So and it's just you know it's just a very special case. It's not. Uh, it's not like other libraries uh, because it's just yeah it's the it's the one matrix multiply is the one thing that's special, so it needs uh, it needs its own thing. So it's something to consider. I think you yeah you might actually need a, a WASM blast at some point. 